welcome to episode 10 of the second series of Among the Ancients, a close reading series from the London Review of Books with Emily Wilson and me, Thomas Jones. Following on from last month's episode on Tacitus, today we're talking about his near contemporary, the poet and satirist Juvenal, no less conservative than Tacitus, but considerably less austere, I suppose you could say. So, Emily, there are there are ways of roughly dating Juvenal's 16 satires, and there are various, or even many, spurious biographies of him. But how much, if anything, can we be sure of about who he was? Well, we can't be sure of very much about the biography. We know, as you say, roughly speaking, the dates. Um, he was born probably around 55 AD and died probably fairly soon after the death of Hadrian, so maybe around 140 AD. Beyond that, exactly what his social class was is debated. The, the, uh, the ancient biographies consistently say that he was exiled and spent time in Egypt and perhaps also in Britain. And it's possible that he was actually exiled by Domitian and then brought back by Nerva, which would kind of fit the fact that he seems to have... I mean, if one thinks the account in the satires of how awful it is to be a client and have to suck up to rich guys to get any money, maybe that's because he was stripped of his property as an exile under Domitian. But it could also be that he's making all of that up. I mean, it also could be that the stories about his exile, which don't don't appear in the satires themselves, maybe that's based on the fact that he seems to have some knowledge of Egypt and, and of Britain. Or maybe he really was exiled. I think it's quite possible that he was. But again, there's no very definitive proof of that. The poems are very much about Rome, aren't they? They're not. He's not complaining about how awful it is in Britain. It's about exactly. how, <laughs> it's how awful it is in Rome. And I mean, a very commonly said thing is that Roman satire is very much an urban genre. And it's very much a response to the huge size of the city of Rome in the first and second century AD a city of sort of a million people with huge numbers of immigrants and huge social change under the empire and the both wealth and demographic changes of the city and the lack of political freedom, but the presence of consumerism and all this sort of melting pot of people, which sort of contributes to the melting pot genre of satire with its linguistic mixing and its borrowing from different traditions. Yeah, I mean, melting pot is almost what satire originally meant, isn't it? That's what, what it means, yes. So it means mix, yes. It means mix, a mixed dish, like a, a casserole or a sausage mixed up from different types of meat. It's a mix, mixy thing, yes. Yeah. So the, the modern sense of satire, which was sort of, you know, spitting image, that's a bit out of date, but that sort of thing wouldn't... I mean, that idea of satire, a bit what we think of today... I mean, presumably a lot of that we get from Juvenal or because of Juvenal, one of the first ones to do that. But when Quintilian used the word, for example, perhaps he was what, about 20 years older than Juvenal, he was he would have been referring to this this sausage type of poem. The sausage type of poem, yes. So it didn't well, it wasn't necessarily attacking a an object of ridicule. Exactly. It's a weird genre because so Quintilian, as you say, says satura no, tota nostrest. So satire is entirely ours, meaning it's totally Roman. And of course, there's a sort of paradox with that because there'd been plenty of blame poetry before that, right? There was Iambus in the archaic Greek tradition. There was a poet called Hipponax, who I can't remember if we mentioned before. But anyway, there was there was blame poetry in the archaic period. There are figures in the archaic Greek poetic tradition like Thersites, the character who stands up and says, Agamemnon's terrible and let me insult him. But, but then, of course, there's already been comedy, which includes, as I think we talked about with Aristophanes, includes direct calling out particular individuals and saying that person is so so awful and it sort of looks like satire from a modern perspective. But that's not what Quintilian means by satura which is this genre weirdly composed in dactylic hexameter, so composed in, a, in an epic meter, the meter borrowed by the Romans from the Greeks, from Homer. So it's sort of presenting itself as the counterpart to epic as the genre that memorializes individual heroes and, and tells you how great they are. Satyr is the genre that's in the same meter, but gives you sort of the opposite of we can just go by stereotypes and instead of memorializing everyone, we're going to show how 
nobody deserves to be memorialized. And I think that also sort of goes with one of the tropes of Roman satire, which is mocking inheritance hunters, which I think doesn't come out in the satires we're talking about primarily today. But that's, I think, an interesting trope because it speaks to how satire is about anti-memorializing. It's not about let's remember the great men of old. It's about let's let's diss all the horrible, totally stereotypical people of the modern city. Yeah, and one of the another the themes of juvenile themes, or perhaps a great overarching theme in some ways, is this fundamentally conservative complaint that everything's much worse now than it was in the old days. There's there's a bit in Satire 13 where he says we're living in the world's ninth age. That idea that goes back to Hesiod, where which we talked about at the beginning of this series, that the golden age decayed into the silver age and into the age of iron. But Juvenal says you know, we're way past the age of iron now and there's no metal base enough to give its name to how awful (laughs) these times are. Yes, so Um, awful, yes. Exaggeration is another of his modes or one of his his permanent... Wild exaggeration, yes. And uh, But then also the idea that it's so much worse now and yet even the old days weren't that great. So it's very often that it's sort of the slippery thing of you think he's saying we need to get back to the days of the Republic or we need to get back to the days before the city was so big and so full of immigrants and women had so much power that they shouldn't have. But then it, he very often sort of undercuts himself and seems to suggest in the old days people were you know, idiots and peasants and we're even worse than that, but they were no good either. So in terms of his, I mean, I suppose... I mean, the question of how bad were the times he was living in really is a is a large question. But I mean, what, I mean, was that question we talked a bit last time about Domitian and the, the sort of bad emperors and the the fear that people lived under and informers, people informing on their neighbours are one of Juvenal's targets. And also, he says that you can't. One of the things he complains about is that you you can't criticise anyone these days because you'll be you'll be killed for it. So was I mean, was he living in a climate of fear and did that? I think he probably was. It's certainly under Domitian, he, I mean, everyone was living in a climate of fear in that period. And I think it actually can be helpful to read Juvenal, not just in the tradition of he's writing after Lucilius, after Horace, after other Roman satirists, but also within the, ty- the context of his time and read him next to people like Tacitus, who, with whom he has a lot in common in terms of that presentation of the modern Roman city, the Rom- modern Roman empire is in many ways dark and terrible. But were the old days any better when they were all so unsophisticated and knew nothing? Maybe it was actually no better, even though our time is worse. So that slipperiness of like, how do you inform on people? How do you tell the truth about a modernity that where speaking out is very difficult? And so if he wasn't able to directly, you know, then we don't have 300 lines about our terrible demission. It's because that would have been impossible. So who who were the people he, he picked on or the types of people that he picked on? So very often it's types, but very often he makes the type into an individual. So he uses exemplary individuals, including those who are safely dead, um, who are then types of particular sorts of people. So we have Sejanus as the type of the ambitious person who comes a cropper through his ambition, or Cicero as the type of the ambitious orator slash writer who comes a cropper through his desire to be a great orator. These various types who are sometimes, he makes up names for a type then that, to hit, that he can then attack. So he's not attacking the contemporary living emperor or, or contemporary living people, but he's very often picking on either made up name types or safely dead trope types. And of course, one can argue about is he doing that in a way that implicitly offers a mirror to his own time, even if he's actually explicitly saying this is a person who's long dead or I've just made them up, but they represent everyone. And and also there'd be people who say that Upper class women who want to have sex with gladiators, upper class men who want to play at being gladiators, gladiators themselves, rich people who won't share their food with their poor hangers on, their poor hangers on themselves. All all these types are included in there. Right. And very often the, the types have to do with a sort of failure to adhere to the um, norms of social class. So very often it's people who shouldn't have any power in society, according to the conservative ideology of the text, um, who then manage to weasel their way into having some kind of agency and shame on them for doing so. So that's part of why it's why it is a sort of fundamentally conservative poetics is to do with an idea that 
most members of society should shut up and be subjugated. I mean, and a lot of it, on one level, or perhaps more than one level, reads as a, sort of a litany of sort of fairly rancid, really, misogyny, homophobia, xenophobia, class prejudice, it's like Fox News or, or GB News on, a, you know, on an especially bad day. So how do we see past that? Should we see past that? I mean, there is, there's a sense of it. Is, I mean, it's not an entirely unreasonable reaction that reading Juvenal certainly for the first time, you might just think, Ugh, this is this is horrible. It's, it's depressing. I want nothing to do with this. Yeah, I mean, I, I sometimes feel that way. And I think we went back and forth because I'd said that we should have Juvenal because Juvenal is such an important author. And I was sort of reflecting on, I first read Juvenal in Latin when I was an undergraduate and I, and I had, a, had had a sort of similar... I'd insisted to my tutor that I did want to read Juvenal. There was some choice about which authors you could do. And I said, I do want to read Juvenal because I know he's really important historically. And then I came back a week later, having spent the week really depressed reading Juvenal. Because, I mean, I, I think I sort of hoped that satire would mean something more like what modern satire might mean, potentially can mean, and that Juvenal would be like the ancient Roman John Oliver, that there would be both... Um, some moral clarity and also some bits that are actually funny. And I think if you're expecting either moral clarity or humour, it's quite disappointing. But I still think it's actually fascinating sort of historically and also, just, I mean, I've gone back and forth about how much I think it's bearable. But I think it's clarifying to to sort of get away from the binary that I think was there very much in the sort of 1990s approach to juvenile of either he really is as toxic as you think he is on the surface, or else it's all an act and it's just a persona and that, and he's actually mocking the toxicity that he's putting forth. Neither of which I think are totally plausible because I think it's to do with the slipperiness. It's to do with, in fact, I've, I, after sort of thinking as an undergraduate, I'm never going to voluntarily read Juvenile ever again. It's so awful. Um, I then, when I was in grad school, took a seminar on satire that was mostly focused on Johnson and Swift and Pope. And through sort of wrestling with the, like a modest proposal, the swift um, account of why it would be great if poor people would sell their babies to rich people so they could get eaten and that would solve the population issue. And Claude Rawson, who was the teacher, was really, really good at showcasing the way that a modest proposal is not saying, it's not not saying poor people's babies should be killed, but it's also not quite saying it because it's funny. And I think Juvenal is always in that space of he's not not saying the horrible things you think he's saying, but he's also always slipping away. So I think that's part of it is just the fascination of how does he manage to do this? How does he manage to be so slippery and be both saying and not saying all the time in such an excessive and crazy way? And it's both crazy and yet it's also totally stereotypical. So how does it manage to be both so wild and so normal? And also the language is weird and interesting. I mean, the com I think there may be ways that you partly get it from the Peter Green translation and partly not. The combination of different linguistic registers that he's drawing from, the way that he's so good at coming up with sententiae or sort of phrase zingers like bread and circuses or mensane and corpore sano. He has these sort of, it's wild and all over the place. And then all of a sudden there's the very, very focused, this is what it's all about phrase which sort of catches you and you think he's insane and yet he's, he's not insane. So the confusingness of it, I think, is part of it and part of what's fascinating about it, even if you don't think it's fundamentally all that funny. Thanks for listening to this extract from Among the Ancients 2, a close reading series from the London Review of Books. To listen to the full episode and all our other close reading series, including series one of Among the Ancients, sign up to our close reading subscription at lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link in the description.